good. I guess it's still morning, right? <laughs> so um, I want to start with just um, giving you a little bit of information about myself as we talk about disability, uh, dignity, and the image of God. I'll, I'll leave that up there. Those are just some things that you might want to know uh, about me. Uh, as I said, uh, I do have a, a doctor of ministry from Liberty, um, but because I'm also a glutton for punishment, I'm also currently a PhD student <laughs> where, where I am studying further um, on the ethics uh, and on helping us to understand more about disability. Um, but it, as it was also stated, uh, I was diagnosed at the age of 36 with uh, Asperger's, which now is a part of the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and that comes from years of social anxiety, sensory processing challenges, uh, all things that I never had a label for or a way to explain how I viewed the world. And so at the age of 36, after um, a significant period of challenge where I was becoming the lead pastor of a church, uh, I decided to finally get some help and to figure out what it was that I was struggling with my entire life and why um, those challenges continued to persist even though I was being told that I should be a different type of person. And so before I, I get started, I want to tell you just a, a little story. Um, there was a story of a woman who was ill and unfortunately she uh, passed away because of her illness. And so when she got to heaven, she went up to the gate and she could see her family and friends waving through the gate. Uh, and, and Peter was at the gate. I don't know why in every heaven story, Peter's always at the gate. <laughs> Have you noticed that Peter's always at the gate? And so she goes up to Peter and she says, hey, how do I get in here? And her family is waving and they're excited to see her and she can see through the gate, it looks like there's a party going on. And Peter tells her, oh, it's simple. In order to get in, all you have to do is spell one little word. And she said, well, what's the word? He said, love. And she said, oh, that's easy, L-O-V-E. He says, welcome to heaven. We've been waiting for you. Come in and enjoy eternity. Your family and friends are here waiting for you. Well, a few years passed by and the woman was walking around heaven and she ran into Peter who was looking very frantic. And he grabs her and says, hey, listen, uh, the Lord really has me busy working on some things today. Can you do me a favor and watch the gate? And she says, well, sure. And he says, now remember, if anyone comes up, remember, have them spell the word. And she says, love. He says, yeah. So if anyone shows up, just make sure that they get the word right and then you can let them in. And so she's standing at the gate and all of a sudden her husband shows up at the gate. You know where this is going. <laughs> and so he sees his family and friends waving, and, and it looks like there's a party going on, and she's standing at the gate, and she says, oh my God, it is so good to see you. She says, before I let you in, uh, tell me some things that happened after I died. And he kind of paused, and it, very hesitant, and says, well, about six months after you died, because you died and your sister sort of kind of looked just like you. I kind of married your sister about six months after you died and she just rubbed her chin and says, oh really? She says, well, what else happened after I died? And she, he says, well, you're not gonna like this either, but about six months after I married your sister, he won the lottery and won $105 million. And he says, but enough about me, his family is waving him in, enough about me, how do I get into this place? And she says, oh, it's simple. All you have to do is spell one little word. And he says, well, what's the word? And she says, Czechoslovakia. <laughs> <laughs> now, I share that illustration because whether we realize it or not, there are gatekeepers, if we could all agree that heaven for Christians is the ideal. But there are also gatekeepers to what the ideals that we share as to what it means to be human. And from the 1600s, around 1635, 36, uh, Puritan theology, Christian theology, has for the most part up until this day been the gatekeepers in deciding what disability is and how those terms have been used. And so we as Christians, whether we realize it or not, have had a profound influence on 
on how disability is viewed and how people with disabilities in our nation has been, have been socialized. So we have to begin to have a, a robust discussion about how to understand disability. Now, I, I'm gonna give you a standard uh, understanding of disability. Within the disability community, there is a various debate about, uh, but in order for us to sort of get a baseline to understand how most of society views disability, we will define it in the following terms, and that is that disability is most often associated with medical or health conditions such as physical impairment or limitations, mental or emotional conditions and or injuries, health independence and engagement in society of people with disabilities can vary depending on several factors. And that is severity of the underlying impairment, social, political and cultural influences and expectations, aspects of natural and built surroundings, availability of assistive technology and devices and family and community support and engagement. Now, what I wanna share with you are two primary views of disability. While there are several, the two primary views of disability are the medical model of disability and the social model of disability. The medical model is rooted in a biomedical understanding of health, which understands health in terms of biological factors alone. So it is purely about what is happening in and to the body. The core of this model is to produce research that can uncover the cause. And what I like to tell people is, as Christians, uh, and even as we talk about science and faith, we oftentimes are perplexed with and we continue to look for the causes of things. The entire book of Genesis is an origin story because we like to understand the cause. But the medical model of disability perceives disability to be a challenge based on a person's body, its inability to function or be normal, whatever that means, and the direct cause of the condition. And this model has a heavy emphasis on curative measures rather than community support. So in the medical model of disability, that view is that the problem and the only quote unquote problem is what is happening in and to that person's body. Therefore, all research and all efforts are aimed at either finding the cause so that there can be a cure or finding ways to make sure that the conclusion of that person's life is done with dignity. The social model, however, of disability departs significantly from the medical model. It pays acute attention to society and the ways in which it socializes persons with disabilities. The social model of disability does not view disability simply as an impairment to be managed, by medical intervention, but rather a more complex understanding of the ways in which society's narratives about disability are more disabling than the actual biological impairment. And so what I often tell people is, while I have sensory processing challenges, executive functioning challenges, there are many things that I'm challenged with. As a matter of fact, I share with people, I'm really only good at two or three things but I'm really good at those two or three things. And I've learned to help to find assistance with the other things that I'm not so good at. In other words, I live in those who are neurodivergent, uh, those who have physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities, or developmental disabilities such as autism or ADHD. We live in a world that is not built for us. And what the social model says is, is that Oftentimes, the way in which we socialize with people who are disabled and in the ways in which narratives about persons with disabilities are told in our society, those things are actually, at times, more disabling than the actual physical impairment itself. So the social model helps us to understand that there is a social component in addition to perhaps some of the medical and physical components. The challenge of being disabled is a challenge that requires whole scale societal and environmental changes. 
the management of disability is a social responsibility and therefore it should be seen as an issue of human dignity and human rights. So therefore it is not simply about providing physical accommodations, ramps, elevators, and those types of things, all those things, although those things are vitally important, what is also important is for us to not allow ourselves, particularly those who are Christians, off the hook by assuming that the way that we enhance and provide quality of life for those with disabilities is purely based on how we address the biomedical issues that they face that the social model says that we also make this a matter of human dignity and human rights. So for churches and faith communities and faith-based organizations, this means including disability in our discussions about diversity, about dignity, and about justice. It is not merely something that we seek to fix persons with disabilities, and there is a, a multitude of different opinions about how we go about engaging with persons with disabilities, but ultimately when we understand that there is a social component, then we understand, particularly for those of us who are Christians, because Christian theology has largely been in the seat that has defined this in our country, we must, as we begin to talk about dignity, see this as a matter of diversity, dignity, and justice. The social model also advocates for the participation in society in ridding, ridding ourselves of disabling structures that serve as barriers for the disabled. One of the largest challenges for me in becoming a pastor of a church is that my neurology is much different from that of what we call a neurotypical individual. In other words, I tend to see the world in a vastly different way than other people experience it. And because it is a minority view of the world, oftentimes there are opportunities that are not afforded to persons like myself because I am neurodivergent. And so while many people see me as being successful, I like to tell people I've had a rough success, that there are a lot of challenges that I've had to overcome, not necessarily related to the way in which my brain works, but to the way in which society views the way that my brain works. Because a primary perspective in this model, the social model, is, is social, the issue at hand is a robust examination and critique of the cultural and ideological understanding of issues such as impairment, chronic pain, suffering, and body image. Uh, I, I should also say, and this is something that is, is a point of, of a blessing for me, that uh, recently, as of last year, uh, I completed a year of treatment for stage three cancer. And so I'm happy to report I'm now cancer free. But with the treatment came a new under, profound understanding, not of just my neurological differences, but of chronic pain. Because of the chemotherapy, I continue to have issues of neuropathy, uh, particularly in my hands and feet. And that has given me a, a new understanding. And as I, as I continue to write and research on helping, to under, helping the church to understand not just about physical disabilities, but also those who suffer with chronic pain. So the question then theologically is, what does it mean to be human? Because there is no way, whether we disagree about uh, me using a primarily medical or social model of disability, there is no way for us to disconnect the two. That there, is, there are social implications, and for Christians that means that we have to think theologically about what it means to be human. There are 61 million people in the U.S. that live with disabilities, and that's just adults. Those are numbers for persons between 18 and 65. They do not include age-related disabilities because all of us, we do realize that if you're not a part of the disability community now, if you live long enough, at some point you will become a part of that community. So that doesn't include children or those with age-related disabilities. That's 26% or one in four adults. And this is why disability is also a matter of diversity because the largest minority group in the U.S. and in the world are actually persons with disabilities. 
So as we are continuing to be on the forefront as Christians talking about issues of diversity, one of the things I write about in my research and in my book is that we cannot have an honest discussion about diversity until we also include the largest minority group in the world, which is persons with disabilities. And it is the only minority group that you can join at any time for any reason. And as I stated earlier, if you live long enough, you will become a part of that community. So one of the scriptures that is often used in, in disability theology is John chapter nine. And we all know this, as Jesus is walking along the road, he saw a man who had been born blind from birth and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? Which I always say is a ridiculous question because how much can a child in utero sin in order to be born <laughs> blind? But Jesus is not just having a conversation with his disciples, he's also having a conversation with history and theology. That a historical and theological view of disability for them had been that disability is the result of sin. And that is still very much prevalent in Christian communities today. So Jesus says that this didn't happen because of his sins or his parents' sins, so that, but it happened so that the power of God can be seen in him. So Jesus, as we ask the question, what does it mean to be human? How do we understand the dignity of those with disabilities? Jesus changes the question from why can't this man see to how can God be seen? I want to pause there for just a second as we travel towards using the influence that we have had as Christians, because Christianity historically in this country has defined theologically what disability means, Jesus in conversation with disability history and theology changes the question from the cause to the quality of this man's life. How can God be seen in him? So in order to restore dignity, I think there's a few things that we have to have a robust discussion about. One of which that often comes up because many of us have been unknowingly trained in the medical model primarily, even if we didn't have the terms to define how that's how we viewed disability, we tend to think along the terms of design. In other words, Eyes were meant to see, ears were meant to hear, legs were meant to walk, which is primarily a construct of the medical model of disability. And so we tend to believe that issues of design and design alone define what disability is. But there are texts that actually have us have a better conversation about what that means. This is one of those when Moses said to the Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past or now, even now that you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech, a slow of tongue. Moses says that I have a speech impediment. And then the Lord said to him, who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, sing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And what is interesting is that God seems to be claiming not only that he is aware of Moses' disability, but there, in some way, God is also seen in and through his disability, which reshapes the conversation about design. And there are many other uh, scriptures that challenge us in this way, because God seems to claim that there is some divine nature and there is divine ability to see him working in and through Moses and somehow God seems to connect it to being a part of his design for Moses' life. So we have to have this discussion about design. One of the things that I often challenge people to think about because most of us have been primarily shaped by the medical model and by design thinking is that we have to decenter ourselves as the primary point of discussion about design because we tend to believe that we are God's crowning achievement of his intellectual and creative ability. But what if we decentered ourselves as humans in a way of having a better conversation about design 
and look at the totality of what God created. For example, there are birds that have wings that do not fly. What does that say about God's creative genius? And what does that say about us having a better conversation about the discussion of design? Because God seems to have created other creatures who have limbs that do not function in the ways that we think they probably should function. Yet, I don't know that other birds are looking down on ostriches, penguins, chickens, and turkeys (laughs) for what they're unable to do. But only when we zoom out of humanity as being the center of God's intellectual capacity and God's creative genius do we see that the discussion about design cannot necessarily be centered on humanity. We have to zoom out. We also have to use science to explore God's creative genius. That human bodies, again, are not the sole reflection of God's intellect. There are other ways in which God has designed his creation to work in ways that if we also impose the medical model on the rest of creation, we would find that there are some things that we would not be able to understand because they don't function in the way in which we thought that they should function. We have fish that are actually mammals that breathe oxygen. And God in his creative genius helps us to understand that we are not the center of what it means to think about design. So the creative narrative suggests that also, excuse me, the creation narrative also suggests that independence is not an element of our design. When we talk about what it means to be human, oftentimes, whether we have this language or not, we have taught ourselves that what it means to be human is to ascend to utter independence. When the reality is, if we look at the creation narrative, humanity was created last, and everything that God created when he placed humanity in the environment is an accommodation for the ways in which we are humanly limited. The air we breathe, gravity itself is an accommodation that assists us in our mobility. So we are, as human beings, not independent from the ways in which God created the world in order for us to be able to function, which now makes us even back away further from the idea that in order for us to understand disability, we have to place it up against the idea that independence is the goal. None of us are independent. We were created with a sense of interdependence. And so in order to talk about dependence, we have to understand that we are designed to be dependent. The total ecology in the way in which God created the world suggests that we are never going to be totally independent. Therefore, disability cannot necessarily be described by the level of a person's utter independence because we are all independent, are all dependent. As a matter of fact, unlike other Uh, creations that God has created, humans are actually born with mobility challenges. I don't know if you've noticed this, right? When a horse is born, the horse walks. Humans, on the other hand, we have to grow into some sense of mobility. So therefore, by definition, we are born with limitation. We are born utterly dependent. We are not born, as most of us in the West think, of humanity as being utterly independent and to gain a sense of mastery over things. But yet, if you look out on all God's creation, we're one of the few creatures that are not born being able to walk. And we also think about the fact that humans age towards limitation. I said this before, that if we all live long enough, most of us will find ourselves in the disability community. As a matter of fact, many of us don't think of it in these terms, but I'm looking out and I see many of us wear eyeglasses and some of us have contact lenses. If you have any sort of uh, accommodation that helps your body to function in a certain way, 
that means that technically you are a part of the disability community. That even eyeglasses are something that is an accommodation for a limitation that has been placed on your body. So humanity should not be defined by independence, but rather, theologically thinking, humanity should be defined by our utter dependence, not just on the environment that God created, but on one another. So therefore, we move away from a purely biomedical understanding of disability, and we engage in a social understanding of disability, which helps us to understand our role in bringing dignity to those whose bodies function differently. So disability inclusion requires the creation of substantive, adequate, and considerate policies, procedures, and societal practices that provide systemic support for the full inclusion of persons with disabilities, whether it's physical, intellectual, or developmental, we are, as Christians, to provide wholesale changes in our society for persons with disabilities to help them with full inclusion in the public life and service. And that also includes, but it's not limited to, an impact on their material experience, the ways in which they experience the world by increasing their engagement and social activities and social roles that are normal and necessary components of any thriving society. So that means that we should then begin to construct a society where the roles that they can also engage in in society include roles as students, employers, employees, friends, parents, spouses, educators, and religious leaders. So I want to leave you with one last story. My wife and I I uh, have three beautiful boys, um, and so this happened years ago when our, our middle child, uh, he was in a stage where he was lo losing teeth, and uh, he, he lost a tooth, and so he sat down with his mother, my wife, to write a, uh, a letter to the tooth fairy. <laughs> and so he writes in this letter to the tooth fairy, dear tooth fairy, I would like, watch this, $40. $40? <laughs> now, I understand inflation and you know, cost of living increase. You know, when I was young, we used to get a quarter. Best I can do for you is $2. And what he said was in the letter was that 20 was for him and 20 was for his brother. I knew somebody was going to say, oh, you're still only getting $2. <laughs> but here's the point, and here's what I want us to think about as Christians, as we use science and faith, and as we try to create a world that is better for persons with disabilities. He understood intrinsically, without having to be taught, that his body was far more valuable than what it was being assessed as. And what we are responsible for as Christians is to help those with disabilities and to rethink the ways in which we have defined disability, to help people whose bodies may function differently to understand that they are intrinsically valuable, far more valuable than the ways in which society has historically treated them. That they are valuable and they have dignity because they are created in the image of God. Thank you. Thank you, Lamar, for that inspiring presentation. Um, for those of you who have questions and haven't submitted them yet, please do get them submitted to the app and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. We've had a lot of really good questions submitted already. Um, one question that's, or one set of questions that has come up numerous times as I've been scrolling through is thinking about, you know, I know that there are pastors in the room, I know there are a lot of people in here who are leaders in their church, and they're wondering about just some, some really practical ways mm -hmm. that they as a church can minister better to those in the disability community. Yeah, that's a great question. One of the things that I often share with pastors who are in churches that I consult with is a way to, to create long-lasting and systemic change is to find ways to place persons with disabilities and their families in positions of real leadership in the church. 
You can often tell a organization's commitment to diversity by who it allows to lead. And so one of the things that we often see in the church is we want to do ministry for persons with disabilities and we have lacked the creative imagination to do, dis to do ministry with persons with disabilities. And some of the barriers that continue to exist in the church are because when ideas of what church should look like and feel like and sound like were constructed, it was constructed by all the same type of minds. You didn't have persons who were neurodivergent at the table. You didn't have persons with physical limitations at the table. And those persons will help you reshape and reimagine what church and what ministry should look like. So uh, my 30,000 foot answer to that is find persons uh, within your congregation and they're there, it's one in four. Um, and there are also people who are adjacent to your congregation. You can find them in the school system, children and families that have IEPs. Um, there are organizations in the community that are serving the disability community. The indictment on the church is that those families and individuals are going to every other organization but the church to get support. And so build partnerships with those organizations that are also already serving and then find ways to bring those persons along, create maybe a, a subcommittee, meet with them, and then put them in positions of real leadership because one of the things that we are challenged with in the church is we, we want to invite persons with disabilities, but we don't always include persons with disabilities. And the difference between being invited and being included is being invited means I'm asking you to share sp space. Included means I'm asking you to help shape the space. Mm -hmm. And so we need persons with disabilities to help shape what our churches should look like so that those unintentional barriers start to come down. That's great. Um, one of the questions that has come up has, has talked about uh, peoples with disabilities wanting to pursue ministry. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could speak to how we can support those individuals better so they can really have a true leadership role in their churches. Yeah, and, and that has been, a, a, over the years, a tremendous challenge for me. Um, what I will say is I recognize my privilege um, because I am a, a lead pastor, have been for several years, but one of the ways in which we could open up the pipeline for more persons with disabilities to be in leadership is to radically reorient our ideas of what leadership means. One of the largest barriers for myself, and I talked about this being neurodivergent, is that I didn't fit the stereotypical uh, role of a pastor. Um, I, I do have challenges with social anxiety, although I've worked really hard over the years, I tell people what you see is a very practiced and polished Lamar. I've had eight years since my diagnosis to work on these things. Um, but that was an, a huge barrier. I think we really have to reimagine what leadership looks like. We have a very narrow uh, model of what leadership looks like in most of our organizations in our churches. And again, it's because the people who decided what a leader looks like are usually not people from the disability community. There are a number of gifts and skills and talents and passions that persons with disabilities have, but in order for them to have access to leadership, we've got to almost throw away any preconceived notions that we have of what a leader is and reconfigure that. And so uh, for me, it starts with, with some of our institutions, uh, Bible colleges and seminaries that are producing leaders, having more curriculum uh, to teach about disability, to help us to understand the differences between the models and how the church should interact. And slowly but surely, we'll begin to produce leaders who have a heart for the disability community, but also won't put up restrictions for potential leaders from the disability community. Yeah, that's great. This question is an interesting one. It's gotten a lot of votes. Um, do you think that people who are disadvantaged in various ways have a hermeneutical privilege in scripture? Are they better equipped because of their position to understand scripture? Wow, that's a great question. Um, so I don't want to say um, advantage because it might seem as though, you know, it's kind of teetering on narcissism, right? Like I have a special knowledge because I'm disabled, <laughs> um, which is not the case. But I do know that all theology is contextual. And so... Um, you, you, our, our lived experience, we experience God in and through the bodies that God gave us. Um, and so we can't disconnect that. What, what 
we do see is, is that persons with disabilities are living and experiencing God in and through the bodies in which they inhabit. It's an embodied experience. And that experience tends to be vastly different from those who are able-bodied. So you get a different perspective of scripture, a different experience of God, a different experience of worship, a different experience of even interpreting the scriptures. And I think it is healthy for the church uh, to include that because it gives us a fuller picture of who God is and God's creative genius. And so while I won't say that there is an advantage, I do think that there is an advantage for the church to include those persons and their understanding of God and their experience with God because the way in which we understand God comes through the bodies in which we inhabit. And so not an advantage, but there is a difference. And I think it makes for a more robust and healthy understanding of God when we include persons with disabilities. I mean, based on your experience, I mean, can you uh, delineate any specific things that we lose when those people are not included within our congregations? Yeah, I, I think one of the primary images in the New Testament is this image, and Paul uses this a lot, of the contest between flesh and spirit. Um, for most people with disabilities, that is more than just theory. Um, that is a real contest. Um, because I have sensory processing issues and other things, um, even though autism is, is neurological, there are some things I experience physically. Um, so, so when we talk about the contest between body and spirit, that's not a theory for people like me. That's a real lived experience. That's not a theory for persons who have physical limitations. That's a real, and so I often tell people my faith oftentimes is leading rebellion against my body because sometimes there's things that my body don't want to do. Now, I do advocate for understanding our limitations. There are things that I'm just not able to do. But I said all that to say that there is um, something that the church misses in understanding those verses like that and those ideas because for people who are primarily able-bodied, they don't see it as anything other than just a spiritual thing. Um, but those with physical disabilities, intellectual or developmental, actually have lived practice in understanding that contest between flesh and spirit. And there's, there's a whole wealth of knowledge that can come into the church when we understand that that lived experience helps to illustrate what Paul is talking about. Absolutely. Um, I think this question stem, like comes out of your response quite well. Um, that you know, we recognize that disability can be a, quite a broad spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, how do we celebrate disability as a gift of diversity for the church and for all the insights and things that it can give us as a body while also lamenting the real pain and suffering that's endured by those with really profound disabilities? Yeah, <clears throat> so I, I think that comes in um, not completely abandoning the medical model. Um, there are those within the disability community and disability activists uh, who, who may disagree with that. Um, but we can't completely abandon that because that also, it, it helps us to address real physical felt needs. Um, what I'm advocating for is that when we solely focus on the medical model, we absolve ourselves of our responsibility as a society to remove societal bar barriers and narratives about disability. And so I think there has to be a good marriage between the understanding of the two so that we can celebrate uh, persons with disabilities in the ways in which God works and how, as John uh, 9 says, how God can be seen in their lives. Um, and they're not just test cases. Um, also, I should say it helps us um, when, we, when we have a grasp of the social model to not treat persons with disabilities as object lessons um, that teach us how good we have it, um, but they're real people. But then also marrying it with the medical model says that we also have a responsibility to address the real issues of pain or chronic pain uh, or suffering. And so to, to marry those two, to, to be able to celebrate that this person is wonderfully made in the image of God and as a, a body of believers, we also have an obligation to help with the things that may be associated with their disability. All disability, I should say this, 
does not equate to suffering. I think that is um, something that we need to also be aware of. But in the case where there are things that are attached to the disability that do create pain, we need to also understand that we have an obligation uh, to minister to them in that way as well. I'm going to ask a question that just stems out of our own personal experience. I talked in the introduction about how our family really struggled with feeling marginalized in our own church. Mm -hmm. And as, you know, as we were growing into understanding what it meant to have a child with, with some disabilities and some special needs, there were individuals in our church who seemed like they wanted to help. Mm -hmm. They didn't know how. And when they asked us, we didn't know what to tell them either, mm -hmm. right? So for a lot of families that are dealing with these things, what would you say to encourage families in that situation where the, their church isn't helping as much as they might like, but they don't know what to tell them either? Yeah, that, that's a tough one because obviously each family has a different set of circumstances. Um, one, one of the things I talk about in my book is I have um, a section on, in there about um, how to pastor, how to shepherd, uh, families impacted by disability or special needs. And one of the things that I encourage uh, clergy to do is I, I looked at um, David and how David talks about in Psalm 23 how God shepherded him. Um, one of the things that came out of that is we, we never see God have a speaking role in that 23rd Psalm. Yet David is a keenly aware of God's presence. And so I think one of the best places to start, and of course this is not the, the end, um, but one of the best places to start in trying to be able to help is as, as clergy, as pastors, as preachers, uh, ministry leaders, organizational leaders, we like to, to answer everything. We like to talk. <laughs> um, but what David says is the way that God shepherded him through a difficult time is that he sensed God's presence, but God doesn't have a speaking role. And so I learned this, uh, I spent four, almost five years as a hospice chaplain, and I learned what's called the ministry of presence, which is to be with and to walk with, um, but also understand how to adapt the pace of families who have individuals, have special needs or disabilities. Their life lives at a much different pace than the rest of our life. And so for us in the West, one of the ways that we can really be helpful is to practice the ministry of presence, but also slow down and adjust our pace to a pace that is pastoral to those who need us. Um, one of the things I used to say to our staff all the time, because we have kids in ministry and everything is regimented and at this time everything shuts down because we don't want, many of you have this in your church, we don't want late kids to be a distraction, so we shut down. And if they don't make it in time, they have to. And I would tell my staff, in the grand scheme of all things eternal, <laughs> what difference does it make if a family comes in 15 minutes late, right? Especially if they're dealing with, with because again, when David shows, shows up to the battle um, with Goliath, I say this in the book, he lets us in on a secret that we didn't know. He says, I've been fighting lions and bears. Nobody knew. Right? And what I tell our staff is families with special needs and disabilities are fighting fights that you know nothing about. And so it's our job to adjust our pace and to walk with them pastorally and to be present. And as those needs arise, we'll be able to discern those together. But families with disabilities need to know that they're loved, that they're appreciated, and they don't need any more barriers than what they're battling throughout the week. Thank you for that. In, in considering disability and the focus we have in this in these sessions on, on humanness, how would you define what it means to bear God's image, taking that into account? Yeah, I, I think, and it's, it's super complicated. I could probably teach a whole semester class. <laughs> um, I, take it. I, I think if you look at what Jesus says when they encounter the blind man, he says, how can God be seen? If we think about in Christianity, one of the biggest uh, tenets of our doctrine is, is the incarnation. So we, we best understand who God is through God embodied. We understand God's character, God's nature, God's intentions by looking at how God worked in the person of Jesus. He's in, embodied, the incarnation. And, and I think one of the ways that we can best understand the image of God is exactly what Jesus says, is that God is seen 
in this person's life. Now the question is, are we slowing down long enough to see how God can be seen? What, what are God's intentions? How is God's character com- coming across in the life of this person? Um, and so I, I think that the way that we see the image of God is that we see ultimately, I, I would end it with uh, the love of God, how God is being expressed, how God's love is being expressed in and through the life of not just people who are able-bodied, but those also who uh, have some sort of limitation or, or disability. How is God's love, character, nature, and intentions for humanity being communicated through that person's life, um, even, even if it's being communicated in what appears to be the struggle and the suffering uh, that we see? Oftentimes, that is not uh, it has more of a subjective view but sometimes persons with disabilities um, don't often view their disability in the same way that society does. And even in that, you can see how God is working and see God's image being formed. But, but the last thing I'll say about that is, is that there is also, as I talked about in the talk, um, when we zoom out and understand that God is collectively working throughout creation, how do we as a community see the image of God being formed in us and through us as we invite persons who are differently abled? That's a beautiful vision to end on. So why don't you all join me in thanking Dr. Hardwick.